Welcome to episode 107 of the Swamp Flicks podcast. My name is Brandon Leday. And I'm Brittany Lombas. And we are recording once again over Skype in different parts of New Orleans because we are still under quarantine from COVID-19, as is everyone listening, hopefully. Yeah, this is a um, a sci-fi movie, and this is the reason that I stopped watching sci-fi movies. You're off of them? I can't. It, it hurts too much and it freaks me out. What have you been watching? Like, if you can't escape to other worlds through sci-fi and fantasy. Well, the thing is, is like a lot of sci-fi movies, like the ones I'm that I dive into, I'm like, hey, I haven't seen this before. It's like, oh, there's a virus that escaped. And I'm like, son of a bitch, turn it off. You know, every <laughs> everything's just scary. And it reminds me too much of this. <laughs> but yeah, I've I've really been watching a shit ton of movies lately. None of them sci-fi. But uh, there's a lot I've been watching, but there are a few that I do want to bring up. The first one that I like watched that I really, really enjoyed is called Bunny Lake is Missing. At first, like reading the title and I'm like, oh, is it like a lake that's missing? Sort of like the story from Fried Green Tomatoes, which was our is our movie of the month, right? Where um, (laughs) there's that tall tale told about the frozen lake that the ducks fly away with. So I'm like, is this like a a whole lake that went away from like erosion or something? Like what's happening? It's a child's name. (laughs) So (laughs) Bunny Lake is a little girl and she's like four. So Bunny Lake and her mother come over from the United States on a ship to live in London where Bunny Lake's mother, you know, she's a single mother and she's moving to London to live with her brother and her child. And while she's moving all her crap in, she brings her child to a daycare and leaves her there. And then when she goes to pick her up, they're like, oh, we don't have that kid. That kid was never even here. What? Right. So at this point, you as a viewer, you haven't seen the kid either. So she makes like these calls to the police and then they're like, okay, let's go to your home. And she sees that all her child stuff is missing from the home that she just unpacked because they literally just moved to London. So at this point, the police and you as a viewer, you're like, is this even a real kid? Does this kid exist? So the whole movie, you're trying to figure out if Bunny is real or not. And if she made Bunny up because she's crazy. And there's a, a pretty big twist at the end that sort of took me by surprise. It was one of my, you know, I was like, it's either this, this or this. It was one of those options. Um, that I had guessed, but I wasn't expecting the film to go that route. And it did. Um, And I'm not going to reveal it because it's really good. But this is starting to become a Swamp Flick specialty because the the ending twist does deal with incest. (laughs) (laughs) I just realized the next movie of the month I'm making y'all watch is also incest related. Oh, uh, no. (laughs) And I had forgotten until I was watching it. And you're like, damn it. Damn it. And you know what? We're going to talk about it again today. <laughs> it's every, it's everywhere. And you, oh God. It's inescapable, apparently. It's inescapable. Like, what is going on with everyone? Um, but anyway, so Bunny Lake is missing. It's a neo-noir style. And it's a really good, like, psychological thriller, which I love. Like, it keeps your brain going. It's not just, like, a relaxing film. It, like, keeps you thinking the whole time and freaking out. And I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, like, a big title that I feel like I should know and watch you know just to to fill in a gap in my knowledge it's very good and it is on the criterion channel it's probably like gonna be like one of my one of my favorite favorites probably somewhere in my top like 150 you know oh wow yeah (laughs) it made it so the other movie i want to talk about that i've watched it's actually new like check me out watching a movie from 2020 while the theaters are closed i watched the other lamb have you heard of that one? No, I haven't heard of that one. Ooh, so The Other Lamb. So it came out uh, a cut, like maybe a week or so ago it was released, and it's a IFC film. I, I like the stuff that uh, they come out with a lot, especially like their horror and sci-fi genre films. Yeah, they, they usually deal with like the extreme end of that stuff. Like their movies can be really violent. Yeah. So this one, it's sort of like filmed in the style of the witch where it's creepy but there's not like full-blown horror in front of you the whole time there's just this anxiety of like what's going to happen next or like you're waiting for some explosion to happen we just don't know when it's going to happen 
so it reminded me a lot of The Witch in that way. And it also it takes place in the woods. <laughs> but The Other Lamb is about a religious cult. And they live out in the woods. And they're pretty small. There's um, a male leader. And they call him the shepherd. And he's got wives. And they have daughters. So like the wives stay in one house in the woods. And the daughters stay in another house. And they all sleep in one big bed. Like... Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory style. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's it's just like that. Only more, like, there was more grandparents in the bed. But, um, yeah, he eventually takes on his daughters as wives. Fuck, here it is again. Oh, my God. <laughs> more incest. <laughs> but it's interesting because in a lot of these cult films where there's like a, you know, like these tiny religious cults that are like set away from society is just all white people. But there is um, there is a black wife, which I was, in- it was interesting. Yeah. Uh, kind of sucked. You know, it was only just one black wife, but there, there was like a, a black wife, which I was kind of like, wow, that's like the first time I think I've ever seen that in like a cult film like this. But they all like pray to the shepherd. They worship him. And I don't think any of the women have given birth to a boy at this point. And whenever a woman does give birth to a boy and during the film, he looks at it as like competition almost. Like there can only be one male leader. So he's kind of like, yeah, let's let that baby die. So basically there's a girl, her name is Sella. And she's a daughter who's like getting ready to become a wife. And she's starting to question the shepherd and like his validity like she was born into the cult. So this is all she knows. And then she starts to realize like, why are we following him? And there's like a cabin in their little cult village where there's a woman who's shunned and she stays there. And whenever the girls go through their menstrual cycle, they're seen as not being pure and they have to spin their menstrual cycle with this like woman in this shed where they like basically starve and live in squalor. And this woman kind of, Becomes a little bit connected with Sella, and she's like, yeah, like, this is how I got stuck in this. It's really, really slow, but it's a pretty, like, explosive ending that it's violent, but not, like, bloody violent. But yeah, it's it's good. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Oh, wow. I, I honestly had never heard of it. I'm going to write it down. It didn't get, like, amazing reviews. Well, it's pretty new, so I guess not a lot of people have watched and reviewed it yet. A lot of people, like, had some criticism of it being kind of slow. But, like I said, like, if you like The Witch uh, and the, the pace of The Witch, I think you would like this. And I'm, and that was a Swan Flicks favorite, so yeah, you're going to like it. The sad thing is that those kinds of movies are, like, way better in the theater where, like, you're not distracted and, you know... It's pitch black and you're like immersed in the sound of it. And that's just not something we can't do right now. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that what elevated the the film watching experience at home for the other lamb was that like I put I lit a candle as my only source of light <laughs> and I took all the lights off and it was like silent. Yes. Oh, my God. It was phenomenal. I, and, I, and I think it would have been a totally different experience had there been like a lamp on <laughs> or like any <laughs> any noise in the background. Like, so yes, watch it at night. <laughs> Don't let sunlight in and no lights, maybe a candle and you're going to love it. I've been dimming all the lamps in the room and then putting my phone in physical locations I can't reach while watching movies. Oh. Like I'll put them in another room. It's so hard to not be distracted. I know. Especially since all the days are kind of bleeding together right now. <laughs> we're living in a nightmare. Before I throw it over to you to what you were watching lately, I want to mention this slightly because I was so disturbed by it that I, I don't want to give it too much life. But I watched this movie called The Babysitter. And it's not the cool one on Netflix. It's um, a 1995 film starring Alicia Silverstone. Have you heard of this movie? I don't think so. Oh my God, it's so gross. So basically the whole movie is just like, she's a babysitter and it's about like the man or the, the father of the family she babysits for and how he like sexually is obsessed with her and like her boyfriend from school and a guy at school that likes her who are also obsessed with her. And even the like the teenage boy or like not teenage, but like 10 year old kid she's babysitting. He's also sexually obsessed with her. And the whole movie is all these gross male like fantasies about her. And it goes in and out. And it's horrible. <laughs> 
horrible, horrible. What's the tone of it? Like, it's supposed to be sexy? It's or? supposed to be like an erotic thriller. But huh. the point of your erotic thriller is like this teenage girl who's babysitting and like all these men are trying to have sex with her and fantasizing where it, it, at the end it gets explosive and like all their this masculine toxic sexual energy like just explodes oh it's so weird and like when the movie was over with i was like why was that made <laughs> like <laughs> like who thought this was a good idea and like how many people like agreed with this <laughs> that it got to the point of being made it was just weird um so i did want to throw that in she deserves so much better she's so good she is so good and she was like the only thing that was good about this movie but even if you're like a diehard alicia silverstone fan like i wouldn't even wipe my ass with this movie <laughs> Ugh. that's a bummer so have you been watching some better stuff <laughs> than that i've been like taking it easy yeah Cece and i were joking about this last episode we did a whole episode on kenneth anger's like short films mm. which are like experimental art and then uh, you and I today picked a pretty heady topic, too. So, like, for the podcast, um, we've been watching these, like, really difficult art films. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, like, highlight some things that were a lot easier to talk about. Because <laughs> I think <laughs> it might be hard to talk about other movies that we're kind of covered today. <laughs> yeah. So I've been watching new movies, too, though. All 2020 releases. I guess I could talk about three that were all directed by women. And all pretty easy to watch, oh. uh, which I think is a pretty good incentive for like watching something new right now. Is that like it's easily digestible? <laughs> One was a documentary on Netflix called Circus of Books. Oh, didn't that just like recently come out too? Yeah, in like the last week, I think. Yeah, it showed up on my things you want to watch list. I think you would like it a lot. Okay. It's about this bookstore in Los Angeles and it's run by this like elderly Jewish couple who are straight and by purchasing that store and through a other, few, few other like strange circumstances this like elderly unassuming like nuclear family couple ended up becoming the largest distributor of hardcore gay pornography in the United States of America Whoa. <laughs> and the movie's directed by their daughter and, you know, it's obviously not something they told their kids when they were raising them. Like, oh, yeah, we sell gay porn when we leave the house every day. <laughs> so it's something that the daughter, like, discovered when she was a teenager. And she's still just, like, obviously fixated on this detail that her parents were, like, in the gay porn industry. <laughs> oh, God. You know, that's such, like, a, a fantasy of mine. Like, you know how some some girls are like, God... What if, like, one day I wake up and I realize I'm some long-lost, like, princess of, like, a town called Genovia or, like, a country called Genovia? Like, I'm like, what if I would wake up and realize my parents were, like, you know, huge in the gay porn industry? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, like, for multiple reasons, too. Like, the store's location in West Hollywood, so it's, like, in a gay community, became this sort of, like, cultural institution just from, like, physically being there and, like, being a hookup spot for people to have sex in the alley behind it. Ugh. But also, through a few other circumstances, they also start producing porn and, like, funding it so they could distribute their own work. Wonderful. And the movie has a lot to cover because of that West Hollywood location and just from them owning that store, I believe, from, like, the late 60s until recently or at least the early 70s, it's gone through a lot of just cultural shifts. Hmm. Like, you know, with the AIDS crisis and right. with like Reagan cracking down on porn and a few other like major cultural touchstones like that. So instead of like trying to cover all that, she more makes it about the family dynamic and just like how just endlessly strange it is that her normal looking parents run the store and they have these like very mundane like mother daughter bickering exchanges that are very relatable and universal but it's in this like backdrop where there's like a wall of dildos behind them as they're like, <laughs> bickering about like very small meaningless things this sounds so great <laughs> it's very, it's like adorable it's a very adorable like family portrait of this like very normal family in a very unusual circumstance it's a very wholesome movie about porn so it hit a sweet spot well brandon sold sold yeah you'd love it Another one on Amazon Prime, I think you would like a lot. It's called Troop Zero. Have you seen that? I've seen the advertisements for it. It looks a little bit like a Wes Anderson movie, just from like the like the graphics I've seen. But yeah, yeah, what's up with it? 
It's got kind of like a twee Wes Anderson feel to it, for sure. I would compare it more to Little Miss Sunshine mm-hmm. than anything Wes Anderson ever did. You know, it's like this like ragtag group of like underdog children who like entered this talent show. But it's within this like fake Girl Scout troop. I think in the like mid 70s in Georgia. So it's got kind of like a true Beverly Hills vibe to it, too, which is what I think you would like about it. Yes. But basically, it's like this little girl is obsessed with outer space and astronomy, and she gets wind that the local Girl Scout troop, their prize at the Jamboree talent show is that they get to record a vocal message that's going to be put on like a vinyl record and launched into space to contact aliens. And she becomes like (laughs) obsessed with this. And obviously like she's a nerd who's into the space stuff. So she doesn't have a lot of friends, but she's fixated on winning this prize. So she gathers a bunch of other like misfit kids from like around her trailer park to compete with the popular girls and like the better funded troops. Allison Janney plays this like bully Girl Scout, like an administrator who like wants to keep them from being able to enter the talent show and embarrass themselves. And uh, Viola Davis is this sort of like overqualified small town lawyer who gets ripped into being their like troop mother. Wow. It's just very cute. And uh, the mid 70s setting and like the space age stuff allows them to play with like David Bowie, like glam rock soundtrack a little bit. Mm. There's kind of a glam touch to it. But mostly it's just these like really adorable kids. And it's one of those things where like there's no way they can actually win this like talent show they're entering, but it's like heartwarming and cute watching them fail together and become friends along the way. Oh, I love like, you know, it's, it is giving off like some true Beverly Hills vibes, but like it sounds like its own individual film too, which I'm I'm pretty excited about watching it now. Yeah, it's like a midpoint between that and Little Miss Sunshine. I think the Little Miss Sunshine Wes Anderson style cuteness of it might turn a lot of people off but i thought it was very cute and adorable and oh, cool. i got a little verklempt during the uh climactic talent show portion a oh. couple times it's like oh they're doing their thing you know we need movies like that right now like you know just chicken soup for the soul type shit right. i i need that at least <laughs> and one more blow the man down which is also on amazon prime and it's probably my favorite out of these three, I think. I did. So I have a fire stick. It basically has like a banner when you turn it on of like all like what's new in Amazon Prime. And literally it's like Troop Zero, blow the man down. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Maybe that's how they got me to the algorithm came for me. Ah! This one is um, two sisters in this like main coastal fishing village. And their mother just died. And... They're like grieving and trying to figure out how much of their life they want to give up to keep the mother's like fishery business and house alive. Or if they like want to move on and go to college and like break apart and do their own thing. And in their like grief and um, bickering, these two sisters end up in possession of a dead man's body. I don't really want to give away how that happens, but Mm -hmm. like they all of a sudden have this like body they have to dispose of. And then through that happenstance, that terrible misfortune of, like, having to rid themselves of a corpse. Yeah, it's horrific. They fall into, like, the criminal underworld in their town that they didn't really know existed. Mostly it's centered around this brothel that's run by Margot Martindale, who plays this, like, terrifying bully in this movie. Yes. And then they also discover that their mother was more involved with, like, the criminal side of the town than they knew. And... Through that, it expands out and they realize that all these like older women in the town who seem like these like sheltered in housewives are actually like running things from behind the scenes. They're just doing it very quietly. And like the cops and all the gruff fishermen up front who seem like they're running things are basically just useless and bumbling around, not really knowing what's actually going on. All the power moves are women in kitchens uh, having these like silent like power meetings like behind the men's backs. It's a really cool movie. It feels like a Coen Brothers style thriller, but less like overwritten. Like the dialogue's pretty straightforward, except that it has this like device it uses where as act breaks, these like fishermen sing sea shanties, like old fashioned sea songs directly at the camera as like a Greek chorus. And it's so weird. It feels like it like breaks into like being a musical all of a sudden a few times. 
And the movie has kind of like a playful sense of humor like that on top of being this like interesting thriller about all these quietly powerful women. And I really liked it. You know, that sounds like something that I can't even like compare to (laughs) or like think of something to like be like, oh, that's like this movie. Like that sounds super unique. If I had to compare it to a movie I know you've seen, I don't feel at home in this world anymore. I think is kind of a similar vibe. And I loved it. That one's a little sillier, though. This one's fun and, like, spooky in a similar way, but it's not as, like, slapstick comedy. But I I think you would like this a lot. If nothing else, just Margot Martindale playing, like, this, like, crime boss bully is, like, a really fun turn for her. Hell yeah. (laughs) Well, that was really fun to go through a bunch of, like, easy-to-talk-about films, because I think today might present a little bit of a challenge. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to talk about a bunch of Czech films today. Starting with, I think, the easiest one and then breaking into the deep end of like the Czech New Wave, like artsy fartsy Criterion Collection style classics that are very hard to parse through. (laughs) And all that's coming up to you right right now. now. Well, well, this movie were remade by Hollywood and it may be. Of course, first of all, they take out the father's sex life. Right. Absolutely See, what, not. I, I like that. There wouldn't be any of that, and including the fact that his girlfriends help him raise the kid. Exactly. None of that, and uh, none of the politics. It would just be probably like one of the odd couple raising a kid. And now it's time for our movie, The Minute. This is where hosts of the show bounce back and forth recommending films to each other. And this time, it was Brittany's turn to pick. What did you make me watch? I made Brandon watch this movie called Colia, and... I've been wanting to watch this film for quite a while. So a a few years ago, I went on a trip to Prague and I stayed in like a shared room situation with like a real Czech film buff and a a very proud uh, Czech man. (laughs) And I was um, sharing, (laughs) I was sharing his room with him, which I I was unaware of until I got there, but it was fine. Oh no. And um, (laughs) he was really cool. He did like the, the way he like made his living is he, he was like a, a background actor in all kinds of movies that would go on in like the Czech Republic. And on my last night there, like he was there And there was a sofa in his bedroom that would face the window and the bed I was sleeping in was by the window. So he was like, you know, let me go ask you how your trip's doing. And he was just, he was in his like tidy (laughs) whities and it was like in the dark kind of, it was just very, it was very interesting. I thought it was hilarious and I was having a great time, but we talked for like five hours straight because he was probably like in his like late forties. So he lived in the Czech Republic before it was the Czech Republic. And he was able to like really give me some information about like his experience whenever they were like Soviet occupied to whenever they became their own Republic. And he also was really, really into Czech film. And I I told him about Swamp Flicks (laughs) and he was like, Oh, you like movies too. And then like, he just didn't shut up about, uh, Czech movies and gave me (laughs) this huge background and I was like wow I was like trying to keep up and just like writing down all the titles and all the directors and writers and stuff because it's like a very small bubble where all of the writers and directors in these like very prominent Czech films like all like know each other they've written for each other at some point they've directed for each other at some point so it's it's a really tight circle And the movie that he recommended the most was Colia. And I was like, I've never even heard of this film. And he's like, it's it's a really good film that shows like the post Velvet Revolution vibes. You can really like feel them in this movie. And I was like, okay, cool. That's like the late 80s, right? When that changed. Yes. So I was like, okay, cool. And I've never watched it. And I was like, you know what? Let's do a, a podcast episode dealing with Czech films. And I'll make you watch Colia. Kolia came out in 1996 and it was directed by Jan Zverak. I'm probably butchering that name, but Jan's father is Zinek Zverak and he's actually the main character in this movie. And he also wrote the film as well. So the director's father, also the star of Kolia, was really good friends with this guy called Lancelov Smoljak. And he was also a major like screenwriter, director, actor in the Czech film industry. And the two of them created this character called Yara Zimmerman. Um, And Yara Zimmerman is huge within like 
the Czech culture and they like are credited with creating him. So he is Yara is just this like fictional character. He's a, a polymath and he was voted the greatest Czech in 2005. <laughs> <laughs> So he was intended just to be like this caricature of Czech culture and the Czech people. And then he became and this fake character, right? Rose to fame and just became like this protagonist in uh, modern Czech folklore. And there's a couple of films that are like based on Yara Zimmerman too. So I thought that was really cool that the star of Kolia is huge. And I think Kolia too... Um was like the biggest money earner they had had up until that point. It was like huge box office in the Czech Republic. Yes, absolutely. And it won the Academy Award and Golden Globe for best foreign language film that year. And I think like when a lot of people in like, you know, other countries think about Czech film, Kolia is something that comes up. So I'm glad that we got to watch it. And I I really did like it. So um, basically... It was made after the Velvet Revolution, which was like a nonviolent revolution that basically ended uh, Czechoslovakia and the communist regime. And then from the Velvet Revolution came what is now the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And they're both countries that are now part of like the European Union. So the film itself does take place in 1988. So at the point where the film's occurring, um, Czechoslovakia is still controlled by the Soviet Union. And the main character in this film, um, as I mentioned before, who's also a director, an actor, and a writer, um, his name is Luca. And he's like, I don't know, he gave me some like George Clooney vibes. Like he's this like charming, like George Clooney, Sean Connery-like guy in his like mid 50s and he's sort of a player in the world with you know i don't want to say womanizer because it's not like he's got like women coming in and out of his apartment constantly but he's like not settled down i called him a uh old horn dog with a heart of gold there you go (laughs) he's like a horny old man and he's sleeping with people like way younger than him but he's kind of cute about it like it should be a lot sleazier than it is. Right. And it doesn't feel icky. Horn dog with the heart of gold. That is exactly, that's perfect. So this horn dog with the heart of gold used to play for the Czech Philharmonic as a cellist. And he lost his position in the Czech Philharmonic. And now he plays as a cellist at funerals. And like these funerals are pretty interesting too. I don't know if it's like the position that we see as a viewer where you're at the top of like a church and you see these huge, like really ornate caskets go in to be like cremated. It just, it felt like very regal, like the way that the whole ceremony was. It almost felt like I was watching like a burial at Westminster Abbey or something. Like It's pretty joyless. Like, yeah, it's not like a celebration of someone's life. It, there's like no life in that no. building at all. And I think the repetition of participating in these like sad, joyless funerals mm-hmm. day after day, like really wears him down. Oh, absolutely. And he also like beautifies headstones. So that's what he does to make money. So he does get an opportunity to make a shit ton of money in a very short amount of time. And all he has to do is marry a Russian woman to give her citizenship that will prevent her from being sent back to Russia. So he agrees to do that. So he marries her. And shortly after they're actually married, she immigrates to Germany and she leaves her son whose name is Kolia, where we get the name of our film. He's like a a three or four year old kid, very, very young kid. Um, So Kolia gets left with her aunt and her aunt suffers from a stroke and can't take care of him. And she eventually passes away from the stroke. So this kid has like legit, like nowhere to go. So he is left with Luca who has no idea how to handle kids. Doesn't want to handle a kid. And throughout like the film, it's very cute like they they start to form a bond with each other like the little so Kolia only speaks Russian and Luca doesn't speak Russian so they can't really communicate very well and like a couple of like 
times when they do like come with like a you know some kind of common term that they both know it's like a false friend word where it means one thing in russia and it means one thing in czech so it's kind of like goofy in a way like watching them communicate with each other but yeah like so luca at first doesn't really want colia and wants like child services to deal with it and they form a bond, like a, a really good like father son bond over time. And at some point they do come and start investigating and attempt to like take little Colia away, which it gets kind of sad um, at that point. But I really liked like the ending of the movie because the ending of the movie takes place like after the Velvet Revolution actually happens. And Colia does go back with his mom and leaves Luca and it's a really sad departure but it's almost like Colia taught Luca how to sort of be ready for fatherhood and Luca one of his you know his girlfriends does become pregnant and at that point like you know he steps into this new chapter in his life where he be- he's going to become a father and he does get his cellist position back at the the film harmonic so it's a really sweet ending and it's kind of cool how like the changes that occur in luca are sort of parallel to like the changes that occur in like his country at the same time so i thought that it was really cool in that way but yeah so that's essentially what colia is about so what's up uh brandon <laughs> how'd you like this movie <laughs> it's a pretty like mainstream movie in a lot of ways like, sometimes when p- people at my, like, job talk about movies, what they say they want is, like, I just want a movie with a good story. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this is that. It's not, like, entirely easy. There's some, like, moral gray areas in the film that's a little strange. Like, even though this, like, old horn dog has a heart of gold, like, he does fuck up a few times. Like, he tries to pressure his, like, Russian wife mm-hmm. into having sex with him, even though that was not part of the deal. Right. And, you know, he learns and becomes a better person over the course of the movie. And then the ending is, like, kind of bittersweet. Like, even though he grows as a person, uh, we watch this, like, you know, very intense bond between this man and this small child that it, like, has to dissipate. Mm -hmm. So, like, there's some stuff that wouldn't be in, like, an American Hollywood version of this film. Yeah. That makes it more of, like, an art house Oscar-worthy kind of thing. But, like... Overall, it just feels very comfortable and, like, easy to watch, especially just in comparison to the other Czech movies we're going to talk about later. It just felt, like, very refreshing to see, like, this is what their, like, mainstream cinema feels like. Mm -hmm. This is what a prestigious and, like, exceptionally popular but, like, sort of normal Czech movie feels like. Right, because I think, like, especially, like, among, like, you know, movie buffs, everybody's like, oh, Czech movies are weird. And they are. Like, I mean, right. we've we've seen Little Otik. <laughs> Otasonic. Yeah. It's, it's weird. Like, their films are, like, crazy. And the Alice in Wonderland and everything. But I think, like, this is, like, a different side of Czech film that is really good that I just, I wasn't aware of. It's got the same kind of, like, golden cinematography as, like, Yentl, which we watched recently. Oh, you're right. Like with those like br- like browns and like very natural hues and yeah yeah it's very subdued but mm-hmm. handsome yeah you know it's like very handsomely constructed but like it's not trying to wow you with the filmmaking qualities it's literally just like a good story and to buy into that you have to sort of buy into the bond between this older man and this young child which sort of plays into the father son dynamic of the people who made it the director and the star of the film being like a father son duo in real life. Like that those themes are sort of like woven throughout the film itself. Mm -hmm. And I did eventually care about their relationship. Like it became very sweet at first. The reason he's annoyed that this young child is around is because he's getting in the way of him getting laid with these younger women, (laughs) which is a pretty base concern. It's like, uh, how do you care about a character like this? I think one of the funniest scenes for me is like he was trying to like sleep with this young woman who was coming to get like lessons with him. So he puts Colia in the bathtub with like a brush with like a like a a clothespin tipped on it, like clipped on it. And he's like, all right, tugboat, woo, play with it. (laughs) (laughs) 
And I'm like, yep, that is 100% me whenever, like, I deal with children. I'm like, yeah, pretend that's, like, a, a pirate ship. Shut up and play with it. <laughs> is that the same scene where Kolya is in a bathtub and he, like, tries to call his aunt through, like, the uh, shower head as if it's a telephone? I think so. I think I, I want to say yes. There's quite a few bathtub scenes. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, this little kid's naked in this movie a lot. <laughs> But yeah, it it was really like I thought like and I'm not one for for children or anything like I don't have a lot like a lot of times when like kids cry and there's like sad movies with kids. I'm kind of like, eh, whatever. But like this, I was like, this kid was such a good actor for a little kid. And, and he's he so cute. was so adorable. He had like those big, you know, he reminded me of, do you remember the movie Dennis the Menace that came out in the 90s? Yeah, yeah. Um, Gunther, the little boy who's like a uh, apple. <laughs> and gets it like <laughs> taken out of his hand with a knife like he reminded me of him a lot like just like these like sad eyes and just pure innocence and oh god poor little thing when he's like where's my aunt <laughs> and i'm like oh fuck she's dead and your mom's not here either yeah like oh. it, it really stabs at your heart when it feels like it even though it's like kind of a cute movie overall and it's really funny when um he like makes friends with like the russian soldiers <laughs> He's like, hey, they talk like me. Let me go hang out with them. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. He looks a lot like me as a kid. Shut up. Like when I was about four years old, I looked a lot like this kid. I'll send you a picture uh, uh, to prove it. <laughs> you were Colia. <laughs> but the part that really like stuck out to me where I was like, oh, I actually do care about what's happening here is when he accidentally leaves Colia on the subway train. Oh, God. Ugh. He momentarily gets distracted by this like hot woman who he kind of knows through the music community. And he just sort of wanders off with her off the subway and leaves Colia on the train. And the panic of him trying to fix that mistake. I think it's the moment when he realizes he actually cares about the kid too. Right. But for me, it was like, oh, I care about this relationship. And I really like want these characters to come out okay. It's something that had to sneak up on me a little bit because yeah. he's such like a, a base, like simple needs caveman uh, <laughs> at the beginning. And I feel like that scene took forever. I don't know. I just remember being like really anxious. And I'm like, when is he going to find him? When is he going to find him? And I was surprised at like how long that went on for. <laughs> yeah, it's a major set piece. Oh, my God. But um, I do want to say that like his living arrangement is like my fantasy. He, like, lives in Prague at the top of this, like, tower almost with this huge loft. And it's, like, it almost reminds me of, like, Rapunzel's Tower. <laughs> and it's gorgeous. Like, the way that they film it with, like, the sun setting behind it. And I think it's, like, like Prague is, like, set up in, like, areas where it's, like, Prague 1, Prague 2, Prague 3. Like, I think it's, like, Prague 1. So it's kind of, like, in, like, the sort of old town portion of it like oh it's just so beautiful i was obsessed with his apartment i think i like rewatched like a lot of the scenes in his apartment just like look at the background and just like fantasize and be like oh this is great <laughs> and supposedly he's supposed to be kind of living in like squalor like this is him after falling down from his former glory yeah no, give give me squalor of that squalor like <laughs> yeah. i know like it, i mean it's old it's not modern but it's it's sweet like and i think it, it adds like that old world charm to this movie that's set in 1988. Yeah, it looks like Yentl. Yes. Oh, <laughs> you're just waiting to hear like storybooks for women, <laughs> sacred books for men. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it's like a very good movie. Um, it's a very good like Oscar movie yep. in particular. Like it makes sense to me that it won the Oscar for that. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's not going to blow your mind or anything. Like it's like afternoon comfort viewing. Uh, and it was kind of interesting just to see, you know, like you said earlier, a version of Czech cinema that's not like... New wave. Yeah, it's it's not crazy experimental art that's like trying to melt your mind the right. way like John Smakemeyer movies are. Right. It's just kind of a normal, straightforward story about this like heartwarming relationship. It's a film that you should be prepared to be surprised by and you should put away your sort of conventions. It's not going to be like any of those things. The best thing to do is to experience it as a flow of imagery, as a set of resonances. It's a film that's going to go its own way. As soon as you try to put a firm interpretation on it, the film reverses it or it tells you, no, you're wrong. And you end up completely puzzled. 
So as you were saying, um, the Velvet Revolution, is that the term you used? Yes, yes. Was a pretty big cultural shift for Czech people. I mean, mm-hmm. the name of and structure of their country changed, if nothing else, during that. And previously in the 60s, they had a similar sort of cultural shift called Prague Spring. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of the same time that like hippie counterculture in the United States or like Western European countries went through this as well where there's just like a youth culture movement um, that sort of brought more liberal ideals into um, national politics. Yep. On either side of that, you and I picked two movies from the film movement from around that time known as the Czech New Wave, Mm -hmm. which, as you were saying earlier about Kolya, is a little different than the French New Wave in that all these people who made these movies are sort of established in the filmmaking industry, and it's this tiny bubble. Mm -hmm. Like, you and I picked two movies today from the Czech New Wave to just sort of like sample the extremities of what it has to offer and they both happen to be written by the same person yep i don't think we knew that when we picked them you know no i no. i'm glad you mentioned that too because i was like holy shit <laughs> whenever yeah, i was like it was watching a it strange surprise <laughs> it's kind of like new orleans where it's like small but you know everybody <laughs> That's how the Czech film industry kind of feels. <laughs> when I was reading about it, it seemed like a lot of the people in the Czech New Wave were like the children of filmmakers who were like just established mainstream Czech filmmakers before them. Right. So like they were kind of born into it. But yeah, like prior to the the Czech New Wave, like a lot of movies were um, like social realist style. So the Czech New Wave sort of like goes against that and everything's like very like avant-garde and like uncensored and full of like dark humor. And so it's kind of like a, a slight fuck you to the, the parents. <laughs> yeah, it just feels very connected to the Prague Spring, like mm-hmm. social revolution that happened within that culture. Right. And you and I picked uh, two movies. Mine's from slightly before Prague Spring. Yours is from slightly after. And they could have came out the same year. Like, there's no real difference between the way they feel, I don't think. Even though they're very expressive, individualistic movies, they feel like they're part of the same cultural shift. Yes. So what movie did you pick uh, from the Czech New Wave? So I picked Valerie and Her Week of Wonders, which came out in 1970. And it's essentially like an erotic coming of age story (laughs) where Valerie is this young girl who is sort of on the cusp of womanhood like she gets her period and at that point you know when you're becoming a woman at that point you kind of look at your world a little bit differently so that's that feeling and that time in a woman's life is expressed in a bizarre like fantasy world very bizarre fantasy world (laughs) so valerie lives with her grandmother and her grandmother the actress playing the grandmother is like a young woman who's just got like her face powdered up with like airspun and <laughs> she's got a horrible wig, which I thought was hilarious. Their wigs are like Halloween party city style. <laughs> I feel like people's ages are determined by the clothes they're wearing and not like how old they actually are. Yep, exactly. We're told Valerie is 13, but she doesn't look like a 13 year old. She doesn't look like a 13 year old, but I think she was at the time it was filmed. They just make her look older, which they put like heavy cat eyeliner on her and they kind of like, like make her up to sort of look like a, like a young woman, but she's still kind of like a kid almost. Well, that makes the movie way more disturbing to know that she was actually a child. Yeah, it is. It's very um, like Brooke Shields and baby doll a little bit. Ugh, I know. Um, so she lives with her grandma and her mother, um, sort of left and joined a convent after having her. And the only thing her mother like left behind was this pair of earrings. So, you know, she loves her earrings and these earrings once belonged to like a constable and the constable wants them back. And he's referred to as the polecat, which is a a weasel. So they call him polecat and he has like a, a little sidekick. Orlik, I want to say it's like pronounced like Orlik in Czech. And he like tries to steal the earrings from Val to give them to the constable. And he eventually like feels bad about it, kind of falls in love with her and goes behind his back and gives the earrings back to Val. 
he also gives her these magical pearls for protection. So if she comes into like an issue, she could just swallow one of the pearls and she'll be okay, which is pretty wild. But Val starts to menstruate. And when she menstruates, like she's like walking through a field and like her blood's just splattering on these daisies. And I want to say like that's the one of the uh, movie posters or movie covers. It's like a, a daisy with blood on it. So it kind of looks like a horror movie. And it's like, no, that's just menstrual blood. <laughs> it's okay. It's not a horror movie. So yeah, it just after that that point, everything just goes insane. It's kind of hard to like keep up with the plot. But essentially, you've got this constable who wants his fucking earrings back, who might actually be her father. And... Orlick, who is kind of in love with her, is like her brother. So she's like swallowing her brother's pearls, which is so weird to think of. And her grandmother, she's sort of like, I guess, envious of Valerie's youthfulness and wants to be young again. So she kind of gives her up and becomes a youthful vampire. It's not not a horror movie because there are like these vampire characters walking around. It's so weird because it's like daylight vampires it's like a mix of like this very fairy tale like fantasy world with some vampires and the vampires don't ever kill anyone <laughs> like no one ever dies from them so grandma is a vampire and is like obsessed with her like newfound youth and everyone like wants something from valerie like all these bizarre characters in here they like all need her like oh her blood's gonna save the vampires and they need her for this and they need her for that and i mean what i kind of got from it is like when you become like i guess like she's entering like that adulthood phase where you start to look at everyone around you and you see people for who they like truly are you know, a stranger is not really a stranger anymore or what you might think your grandma is might not be what she is or your father. Like you sort of, you see people in a different light and you mature. And I think that's sort of what all these bizarre characters kind of represent. Like it's all people in her circle that she's starting to kind of see who they are. And they all sort of like have this bizarre sexual attraction to her too. So it's like, she's becoming this sexual being and she's realizing her like own sexuality and seeing how the outside world kind of views her as a sexual being now that she's like entered womanhood and started menstruating. So it's essentially that. And there's all kinds of wacky, crazy shit that happens along the way. Just disconnected images. Oh my God. And, like, yeah. Plot shifts where characters change their relationships with her from scene to scene it's it's really hard to get your footing in any five minutes of the movie because it completely <laughs> changes the rules like, right immediately after. like the whole time i'm like is the constable and like polecat and her dad like different people and is he a vampire everyone kind of starts to look the same after a while what i saw from that was just like all men and even a lot of women are kind of interchangeable in that they all like want to devour her in this like sexual way. And like her seeing people leer at her sexually on the street is when she sees them like sort of transform into vampires. Mm -hmm. They become monstrous to her just in how they're like gazing at her body in this like hungry sexual way. And I, I guess the polecat thing is that they're like weasels trying to sneak into a oh. chicken coop to like kill her or like violently shake her up and you know there's a lot of dead chicken imagery in this movie a lot of mutilated chickens in this movie it's a lot of birds in general <laughs> just a lot yeah. of chicken and dead chickens though yeah and feathers oh god and if they are the pole cats then she's the chicken you know oh so even if she's coming into this like new sexual awareness, mm -hmm. it's not fun. It's like, no. oh, now I'm in this like world of danger where like everybody, like you said, wants something from me and it's, and it's scary. Yeah. Uh, everybody kind of sucks. I will say yeah. <laughs> that what I thought was like the most surprising about this was that you see that she's starting to like, like Orlick and you have all these like gross older men who are like going after her. They're like sort of the monsters, right? But she ends up like actually having her first sexual experience with Hedvika, who's a woman. <laughs> um, and it's like, oh shit. Like that kind of just came out of nowhere. And I thought it was like really cool. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, women leer at her just as much as men. Uh, they just don't have as like dangerous of a "I'm going to destroy you" look to them, except for her grandmother. Oh yeah. But they're still sort of like hungrily lusting after her in this like very oppressive way. Right. She can't even walk by a brook without uh, like a group of women sort of trying to like lure her over to like <laughs> get right. her to join their their sexual games. Like come in here and put the fish down your dress too, because <laughs> that's so what they're can doing. Wrestle it out, it yeah. <laughs> I was uncomfortable with, like, the nudity that involved her because, like, she was so young when this was filmed. Yeah. I don't know. Like, part of me kind of sat there and, I mean, this film was directed by a guy. So, I think his name's, like, Yaramil Years. And I kept thinking, like, had this been filmed by a woman, which the film that you chose, Brandon, was, and it's not as sexual at all um, as this movie is. I'm like, I wonder if it would have been a little bit, it probably would have been different. And there were women involved in the production. It's, it just seems like she's, like, I understand they're trying to make this, like, a coming-of-age, bizarre, erotic, like, wonderland. It just felt like she was really, really sexualized. Oh, yeah, it's a little skeevy. I, I honestly thought that they cast someone older, so I'm even more grossed out by it now <laughs> than I yeah. was watching it. And it was already very uncomfortable. I know, I know. It just makes it weird. But I did like the calmness that she had during the entire thing. Like she was like, I don't know. She had this like confidence about her throughout all the insanity. Like she was always kind of smiling and very like wispy, (laughs) you know? So I thought that was pretty cool. The whole movie is like basically after a certain point, there's no linear plot to it. It feels like we're just in her dream and we're just sort of experiencing these like strange tableaus like as she's walking through them. It's a lot like Spank Meyer's Alice movie where she's just sort of calmly walking around this like fantasy world and not really reacting to how strange everything is. It's a non-literal representation of entering the adult world for the first time and how scary and bizarre it is. I don't know. I loved the the sort of like Hans Christian Andersen like fairy tale universe with vampires in it. <laughs> it was yeah. it, it felt so weird and I'm like I never I don't think I've ever seen like a the I guess the only like vampire film that would come close to that would be that like Roman Polanski movie, the fearless vampire killers kind of reminded me of that where it's like kind of this like and the vampires are kind of made up the same way where they have like this, you know, powdery white face and goofy teeth. It gave me the, the vibes from that movie. And uh, In the Company of Wolves, that 80s Yes, movie. yes. And I want to, if I'm not mistaken, I think the book that this movie is based off of is the same author of The Company of Wolves. Uh, okay, the story okay. that that movie was based off of. I also got a little bit of a My Demon Lover vibes and how like <laughs> whenever men become horny, they like transform into these like monsters. supernatural monsters. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> And I think if you want to just sort of put aside, if you can, how gross it is that that actor was sexualized at that age, the movie is just sort of undeniably impressive and beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. It accomplishes a lot in 75 minutes. Like it is the most action packed 75 minutes I can recall ever seeing. Yeah, for being such a short movie, it's just explosive. Yeah. So something I I did want to mention is that a few years ago, like there were these gifts going around on like Tumblr and Facebook and Twitter. And it was that scene where she's like called out as a witch and she's like on the stake and she's like, you know, making funny faces at everybody before they burn her. <laughs> so that went around for a long time. And I was like, where the hell is this from? It's very Monty Python. Yes. Yes. That's a good comparison. For I mean, that. I'm sure there were many... <laughs> tumblr pages that were just uh images from this movie artfully laid out it's so beautiful to look at and it's such a uh feminine art design it's like intoxicating i think like my favorite a lot of my favorite scenes in here was just when she was kind of by herself and she was like going around in that like water way with like the flowers floating and the sun kind of yeah. hitting the water. Like, I love that so much. It was just, it's so like fairy like and angelic. It was just so beautiful and feminine. But yeah, I liked it a lot other than like the weird kid stuff. <laughs> but yeah, so the film that you picked, Brandon, <laughs> was <laughs> more like age appropriate women, I think. <laughs> so it's kind of like a, a breath of fresh air a bit. 
in that regard. Yeah, but they're actually acting childish. Like, they're acting, like, below their age, um, which is funny. Oh. And in the comparison. And, like, Valerie is kind of acting more adult-like. Even though she's kind of childlike, she's kind of, like, taking control of a lot of the situations. Well, um, the movie I picked, I only picked, honestly, because it was the only Czech movie I could name that was not, like, a Jean Svankmeyer movie that I considered, like, a favorite film of mine. Mm-hmm. And it's called Daisies. It's from 1966. It was somewhat of a controversial film when it was released. It was banned for a while in the Czech Republic. I think mostly because it was released during a food shortage and there's a lot of like wasted food on the screen where like these characters are like stomping buffets of like perfectly fine meals into Mm -hmm. the ground as this sort of like protest to class indifference and like opulence. It's a hard movie to talk about uh, sort of in the way that Valerie in the Week of Wonders is just because Daisy's doesn't really have much of a plot to it. There's these two women, I want to say in their early 20s, about who dress a lot like children. They wear these like baby doll dresses and have this extreme cat eye like drag makeup. I think they like paint it on with like a paintbrush. <laughs> Which is how I do my divine makeup for Mardi Gras too. Uh, right, you're like brushes so, for that. so relatable to the Daisy ladies. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, they are more infantilized than they are sexy, but sort of by choice. Like all these men in their lives try to control and like turn them into like concubines, but they deliberately make themselves more childish and not sexy at all. Their days are just sort of these empty routines where one of their favorite scams is they get older men to take them out to lunch as if they're going to date them and have sex with them and they just eat these extravagant meals on these like wealthy men's dimes and (laughs) then bounce they like ghost them and send them off on a train yeah and just sort of hang out together in their like shared bedroom um instead of hanging out with these men and they'll like talk to men on the phone while cutting up phallic um food yeah they're like leading men on in sort of like this phone sex kind of way while they're like chopping up bananas and sausages uh and cucumbers it reminded me so much of like the current like asmr situation that's like taking over the internet where people are like isn't this so satisfying and it's like i could see someone just cutting a banana with scissors like that (laughs) (laughs) and it's definitely like a you know we're cutting up dicks joke yes and other than that exchange with men they just sort of generally cause chaos in these like buttoned up fancy situations they go to like a nice restaurant where people are enjoying dinner theater and they just sort of act a fool and get drunk and cause a riot and then later there's this banquet that's being set up it looks like for royalty and they just stomp on the table and destroy the food and like literally hang from the chandelier it's a little weird to talk about the movie in terms of like plot because it's such a visual film if anything like it was just like girls having fun is yeah the plot of it just like two chicks who like are having a good time and hanging out with each other in this like deliberately disruptive way it reminds yeah. me of like freddie got fingered or something where like <laughs> yeah <laughs> normal people don't know what to do with them they're just so loud and obnoxious and like just deliberately fucking with everyone and making everyone uncomfortable for their own like hedonistic pleasure And the movie has fun the same way that they do, Mm -hmm. where, like, it chops up the frame. The way they're cutting up sausages, like, they'll take scissors and cut up the frame into, like, little cubist windows. Or, like, the color grading will shift to black and white to, like, all purple and then back to color. Like, between the way they act and the way that, that the film is put together in that way, it's very, like, chaotic and beautiful at the same time. It just feels like a, like a tornado. And then it's bookended by these images of war Mm -hmm. that aren't really explained, but it seems like whatever they're doing, whatever chaos they're causing is in opposition to these like images of the war that is like driving these food shortages that they're mocking. What what did you make of Daisy's just as an experience? Because it is like a strange immersive experience that you're either on board for or you're not, I guess. I liked it. I I thought like they reminded me so much of like me and my best friend in high school and all like the fun, stupid shit we did. I don't know. I just remember like how it felt to be like that, even though like I was like 15 (laughs) whenever they're like in their 20s acting like they're not in their 20s. But there was like this one thing I remember we were 
I was having a sleepover with my best friend and we were like bored and we're like, hey, let's get that old hunk of bread that's in your mom's like kitchen cabinet and let's soak it in pickle juice and try to eat it. Ooh. Like we would just do weird stuff like that. And it was just like, oh, okay, like everything on a whim, like if it sounds fun, let's do it. And it kind of <laughs> reminded me of them. Like I just like, oh, I remember feeling like that. Just like life was just about like having a good time and not really caring about other shit. I think they're bored too, right? Like they seem so bored in this film. I think they are. I mean, we were on the bayou and we were like 15 and couldn't do shit. So that's why we were soaking old bread and pickle juice and be like, hey, we're going to get high from it. So yeah, like you could get that boredom where it's like, they're like, what are we going to do today? Fuck. Let's like find an old man and like eat on his dime and then jump out the train when he goes away, (laughs) you know? (laughs) But um, I will say that, so the two girls, they're both named Marie, but Marie with the pigtails, doesn't she look like Feruza Balk to you? She does, yeah. Right? Sure. She looks so much like her, like style and, and facial structure and everything. I thought that was pretty crazy. And it seems like she's not really the ringleader. It seems like the other one comes up with a lot of the Hell ideas. Yeah. yeah, just like, I, I loved it. I just loved like just their like playfulness and then their just disregard for high end shit. <laughs> yeah. It was so fun <laughs> to watch them just destroy materialism and all this stupid shit around them. I, I enjoyed watching that. And I do want to say, too, that at the very end, they have these, like, fabulous jumpsuits that they made out of newspaper. Mm -hmm. It looks like something that, like, Vivian Westwood would have created. So part of me is, like, I wonder if, like, this was somewhat of an inspiration for, like, any of Vivian Westwood's designs. Because I don't know if she was, like, designing in the 60s. So something I need to look into. I mean, if nothing else, like, their attitudes and their, like, sort of snotty relationship to rich people feels very punk yeah and like classic punk that like sort of like just snubbing your nose and acting like an obnoxious ass just because you don't feel like participating without needing a leather jacket and a mohawk to do it (laughs) yeah i mean that baby doll dress and that's very black eye makeup became kind of a punk look more in the 90s around the time of like hole and stuff like that yeah oh absolutely like um or reminded me of uh what are they called again The, the band that does bruise violet the Bruce Violet song. Babes in Toyland. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Like they look so much like Babes in Toyland because they did that. They had like that punk, you know, messy kind of childlike hair with baby doll dresses and stuff. God, that Fontenelle record is so good. Yes. I haven't heard that in so long. But yeah, you kind of have to like buy into that being charming or at least like fun to watch to get anything out of this because... It's really hard to find meaning and like direct symbolism in it because the intricacies of like Czech politics and cultural stuff is not something I know. Like I don't right. know exactly what they're thumbing their nose at. I'm not an expert in it, but I got that too. Like for both of these movies, I was like, there's probably a lot of symbolism that I'm like missing just because I'm not like that familiar with like the culture. But I mean, they say something like um, – Towards the beginning, they're like, everything's going bad, so should we. <laughs> so they're saying like, you know, the world's going to shit. Why pretend that it's normal to act proper and fancy? We should reflect how fucked up everything is by being fucked up ourselves. And that's pretty relatable. Oh, yeah. Like, right now. Like, I'm feeling like the Daisy Maries are having like a bad influence on me. Like, I watched that and I'm like, I need to be more like them. Like, I need to, to tap into that again. And... I definitely want to try the the meal situation with like stupid older men <laughs> and getting like free good food. Hell yeah. <laughs> and then ditching. I'm like, yes, yes, they're doing it. <laughs> and there are a lot of scenes of them like just sort of hanging out in their bedroom, not really doing anything in particular uh, and like cutting up their bed sheets and just like being bored and doing these like useless art projects and destroying things. Yes. Where I was like, oh, that feels like quarantine. Like, oh God. <laughs> I feel that energy. <laughs> Especially that scene. It was a uh, V quarantine when they like had like 20 different sheets on their bed and just kept rolling each other and in each sheet. And it was just like, right when you thought like, this has to be the last sheet, there'd just be another one, and then another one. And then there was AstroTurf. <laughs> like, <laughs> stuff just kept coming out of nowhere. It was like a magic trick. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like, it's very quarantine. So I think now that we've gone through this, we really understand their boredom. <laughs> had we not watched this during quarantine, I think I might have had a different perspective. <laughs> well, at least we know what the uniform is to wear if we're going to take this up as like a political act, you know? I have the exact 
cat eye makeup and like baby doll outfit. Yes. Picked out now. If I want to join in their political resistance. <laughs> baby doll outfit, paint on your, which you already know how to do, paint on your um eye makeup. Well, looking at all three of these movies, um, if I had to like pick out any kind of like through line to them, there's obviously a lot of like political stuff in the background, a lot of like like major cultural shifts, uh, especially between classes and between like warring countries. But it's hard to know what's going on without like being like really educated on the history of the country. Right. So what I really picked up on was just how much like sexuality is present in their art. Like even the mainstream movie out of these three Kolya has like a lot of like sexuality to it where I feel like like the American version of that movie wouldn't be as like sexed up. And you know, and this all goes back to like sort of my experience when I was sharing that room and like, the the host was in his like underwear where you know <laughs> i don't care about that kind of stuff so it just kind of went over my head but like i feel like most american people would have probably freaked out right but he was just comfortable and i'm like whatever it's just like another day so i think just that comfort with your sexuality is a little different than it is here like i think like we look at it as like not like we but you know like americans kind of american culture like makes it look sort of like dirty or filthy shameful and shameful where it's it it really doesn't seem like that in czech culture maybe valerie could have used a little more shame though i I, I thought a little more shame (laughs) on her just just because of her age and she probably didn't know what the hell was going on I didn't mean the character. I meant the movie. Like, it should have been a little more shameful about its uh, sexual (laughs) impulses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But yeah, like, um, I think that was a big common denominator in these. And I kind of felt like even though, like, you know, Valerie and Daisy's were very, like, surrealistic and Colia wasn't. Like, there was this very, I don't know, like, the the bohemian lightheartedness kind of existed in all of them equally. Yeah, there's, like, almost a hippie kind of ease to all of them. Yeah, absolutely. They were different, but, but you, you could feel that they're from, like, the same culture do you think you learned anything new about like czech culture or like prague or anything by watching these movies or did you see anything that you felt while you were there sort of represented here like there is a lot of like whimsy where i could feel like like whenever i went to like prague like i don't know like i was obsessed with like all the marionettes and all the weirdness in that kind of old world marionette realm and it kind of like brought me to the vibes in um valerie and daisy's and then Colia, just like like the ease of Colia too. Like it just, I just love it. I wish I could live there. <laughs> <laughs> I just like know a very like abbreviated version of their history, and I know it's like it's massive, right. and it's so recent too. You know what I mean? Like they just became a republic like in the early nineties. I wasn't really that long ago. So um, I feel like that's pretty interesting. So I don't know. I kind of feel like I need to delve more into it. And it like kind of sparked my interest in learning a little more about like more about the film and more about culture and music and the history of the country. Because um, especially Colia, I think, got me more interested than anything. Just kind of seeing how it it was a a realist movie. (laughs) So, you know, having like, you know, like, oh there's like russian tanks in the front of like the home of these czech citizens and they're kind of like anti-russian and the russians like how do they view the czech citizens like you know i kind of started thinking about all that i just i didn't know that much about the history to really make a decision so i would definitely like to dig into that a little more yeah and i'm probably even more in the dark on that stuff than you are because i i have not been there but i did find this just sort of enlightening in just seeing what a normal movie from that country looks like. Mm-hmm. It kind of reminds me of France. Like we see all these like artsy fartsy pics from France, especially, you know, they have their own new wave that shows you like the extremes of cinema and like cinema is an art form, but they routinely make these like run of the mill mainstream comedies and just like normal ass movies there as well. We just never see them in America because they don't get exported very often. Right. So it, it was interesting just with Kolya to see like not everything in the Czech Republic is Czech New Wave like or claymation. <laughs> yeah, Smakemeyer's on his own strange orbit. <laughs> He's on his own realm. <laughs> but yeah, it was just interesting to see what a normal, like heartwarming 
Oscar caliber mm-hmm. drama from there felt like like that was a, a new insight I didn't have before this. Like I find comfort in that, like knowing that like we just watched like three movies from this entire like culture and they were good. And there's hundreds of more, probably thousands of more. So just this idea that like there's so much more out there that's untapped. It's like, I don't know. It kind of gives me like a, an energizing boost to be like, I don't know, like this sense of adventure. Like there's more to find. Like this isn't it. Like there's there's more countries that have their own new wave and their own film world that I don't even know about that might be amazing. Well, uh, next week for the show, James is coming back. He hasn't been on the show since we went into actual quarantine. Oh, my God. Uh, so we're just going to do an episode where we just talk about our favorite movies we've watched since the last time we talked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's a very general topic next time. And in the meantime, I did use some of the free time I've had at home to upload a few of our episodes to YouTube, just sort of as an experiment. I don't know if this experiment has failed or not, but they're up there. No one's watching them. So if you know anybody (laughs) who listens to podcasts over YouTube or um, if you just want easy access to like a recent episode we've done It's just a new format that I was messing around with. So I have like these like slideshow versions of the podcast uploaded to there. There's no visual component. It's just um, some illustrations in the audio. So yeah, check it out. I'll leave a um, link in the notes if you want to uh, jump over to our YouTube channel and just see what I consider like some of the best episodes from the recent batch that we've done. Hell yeah. And we'll be back in a couple more weeks to talk about other movies that we've been watching while locked in our houses. And I hope that you're locked in your own house watching movies as safe as you can be and pleasantly entertained. Use this time for that reason. Stay indoors. <laughs> I was really surprised today. Like a lot of people were out and about um, and not social distancing. So obviously they don't know about all these great Czech movies that we just discussed. So we're going to help flatten the curve with this. Yeah, there were people throwing jazz fest parties in my neighborhood uh, over the weekend. Gross. It was not cute. No. Well, don't be like them. No. Be like us and never go anywhere. (laughs) (laughs) Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.